So I decided that it would be a good idea to do a video about the history of the game of hockey. But as I started writing the episode, it became very obvious it just wasn't going to happen in one video unless I wanted it to be very long. So here's part one, hockey before the NHL. Real quick though, if you do find yourself enjoying this video at any point and you like to enjoy things, then do hit that subscribe button down below and there will be more videos like this one, especially in this series coming up down the road. Now the true genesis of hockey is still something that not everybody really agrees on, with there being carvings of similar looking games being played as early as 2000 BC, and other similar games being played on ice as early as the 1500s. But the first known mention of the word hockey comes from a book dating to 1773 which depicts some kids who might have thought to themselves, how could we improve that game of soccer? Maybe we'll use some sticks and a smaller ball, that, that could work. And it really didn't take too much longer before people decided that it would be even more fun to play it on ice. It seemed like such a good idea that even people in Virginia started to pick it up. I mean, just look at these guys, they've already got the idea. There's a bench clearing brawl, a couple of guys fighting in the background, all while a game is still going on. And not to mention the fact that all of this is happening while they're doing an early filming of the movie Titanic. But it was due probably to the fact that they had longer, colder winters making for safer ice conditions that the people of Montreal were the first ones to really take it seriously. As they thought to themselves, man, this game really has some potential. What if we started organizing some games and maybe even gave it some rules? Like what though? I don't know, nine player teams, a wooden puck-like thing, and maybe eight foot wide goalposts? I mean, okay, but no crossbar? I mean, what if people start to lift the puck off the ice? <laughs> don't be silly, no one can do that. And so it was, just like that, the first game of hockey came to pass. But it became quickly obvious that they were going to need a few more rules. Not wanting to strain themselves too much though, they decided to just take a handful of rules from the game of field hockey and then throw one of their own in just to recover fighting. And so with a new set of rules freshly laid out, McGill University put together the very first organized hockey club, and shortly thereafter Quebec Hockey Club joined them. They did start to realize though that 9 players seemed like a little bit much, so at this point they decided to cut it down to 7 per team. And then, maybe due to the fact that it now took fewer people to put a team on the ice, the Montreal Victorias joined as the third hockey club and many more followed them. Eventually getting to a point that by the 1883 Montreal Winter Carnival, there was enough teams for them to feel like it was time to have the first ever World Championship of Hockey. In this case the word world meaning the city of Montreal, but they were probably the only ones playing ice hockey so I guess it counts. Oh hey, and would you look at that, they even have positions now. Right and left wing, center, point, counterpoint. A rover? Oh, and don't forget the goalie. And in the end, it's McGill University who wins the first ever Carnival Cup and the first ever Tournament of Ice Hockey. And then, just a few years later in 1886, teams formed the first hockey association in the Amateur Hockey Association of Canada, who would play the first ever regular season with teams challenging the champion team for the title. But the biggest event was still the Winter Carnival and that Carnival Cup. And in 1888, it meant even more because the Governor General of Canada himself and had decided to come because his kids had decided that they liked the game. And as it turned out, so did he. But he wondered to himself, why was there no trophy for the best team in Canada? It was a question that must have eaten away at him for years, because just a few years later, Lord Stanley decided to go out and buy a fancy silver bowl to present to the teams as a trophy. Which is cool, but what should we call it? The Dominion Hockey Challenge Cup. I mean, I guess that works, but that is a bit of a mouthful. What if we just called it Stanley's Cup, or maybe the Stanley Cup, or something like that anyway. And so it was that in 1893, the Stanley Cup was first awarded to the AHAC's champion, the Montreal Hockey Club, now recognized as the best hockey team in all of Canada. But at this point, there's other hockey associations popping up all over the place that won a challenge for the Cup, like the Ontario Hockey Association, which was formed by Lord Stanley's son which his daughter was one of the first women hockey players ever. Meanwhile, in the Winnipeg Hockey Association, some of the goalies have started to use cricket pads to protect their legs. Seems like a good idea. Meanwhile, the game of hockey has started to pick up in the States, with Yale and Johns Hopkins playing the first organized game of hockey in the U.S., and shortly thereafter, the first U.S. Hockey Association is born, the U.S. Amateur Hockey League. And eventually, in the early 1900s, hockey would start to grow in Europe thanks in large part to Lord Stanley's sons. But back to the states where the West Pennsylvania Hockey League becomes the first to ever employ professional players. 
This worked so well that they eventually had teams in Michigan and Ontario and become the first fully professional league in the history of hockey, now named the International Professional Hockey League. But now that many of their best players are leaving for the states in order to play professionally, Canada starts to get jealous and starts employing players of their own, as the Eastern Canada Amateur Hockey Association starts handing out paychecks and becomes the Eastern Canada Hockey Association. Basically just dropping the word amateur because now they're professionals. And in response, the Stanley Cup trustees, because yes, the Stanley Cup already has trustees at this point, decided to open up challenges by professional teams. And so everything's going great for the ECHA. That is, up until the Montreal Wanderers owner decides to try and move the team to a smaller rink which he owns. But as it turns out, the other owners of the league weren't too excited about the idea of making less money just so he can play in his own rink. So they all decide to just leave the league entirely and form their own league called the Canadian Hockey Association. I wonder if something like that will come up again later. Either way though, those guys won't be around to find out because it is at this point that the owner of the Renfro Creamery Kings of a different league applies to join the new CHA. But he gets rejected. However, in the lobby of the hotel where the CHA is meeting in order to start their league, he wanders into a representative from the Wanderers named Jimmy Gardner and the two of them hatch their own idea of starting their own new league, and they decide to call it the NHA. And so, in 1909, the NHA is born, and in an ingenious move in order to gain the interest of the French-speaking population, they decide to form a team of French-speaking players, and they call them Las Canadiens, who join the renamed Renfro Millionaires, the Wanderers, and two other teams to form the five-team league. And after all, what's a new league without some new rules, as the NHA decides to remove the rover position, switch from two 30-minute halves to three 20-minute periods, and introduces both major and minor penalties. Determined as ever to win the Stanley Cup, O'Brien starts bidding wars for the best players, starting with the two biggest contracts to that point offered to Frank and Lester Patrick to play for the Millionaires, at $3,000 apiece. And then follows that up by poaching Cyclone Taylor from the CHA's Ottawa Senators for $5,000. And then after just one year of operation, the struggling CHA asks to merge with the NHA, but is denied, although the NHA does decide to admit two teams, the Ottawa Senators and the Montreal Shamrocks. But it's the Wanderers who end up winning the first championship, and with it, the Stanley Cup. But then in the following offseason, three teams end up leaving the league, and the league almost collapses entirely as players become upset over the introduction of the first ever salary cap, which would stop the bidding wars and see a cap put on their potential earnings. Eventually though, a season does happen, and the Ottawa Senators end up winning the cup. Dejected and still without a cup, O'Brien ends up leaving the league and taking the Renfro team with him, but two Toronto teams join in its place, bringing the league now to six teams total. Meanwhile, after having played one year in the NHA with the Renfro Millionaires, Frank and Lester Patrick decided to move west to join their father's lumber business, a business that shortly thereafter they would end up selling and using that money to form their own league, the Pacific Coast Hockey Association. But due to the climate of the Northwest, they end up having to build some of the first ever artificial ice arenas in Vancouver and Victoria, BC, originally forming three teams to start the league, the New Westminster Royals, the Victoria Aristocrats, and the Vancouver Millionaires. I wonder where they got that name from. But they didn't just stop at starting the league, building the arena, and forming the teams. No, both Frank and Lester Patrick ended up playing on multiple teams in the PCHA. And in order to fill out the rest of the rosters, they used their connections back in the NHA to start rating players from that league. And although the NHA and PCHA would eventually come to an agreement to honor the contracts of each other's leagues, the damage had already been done and the PCHA was ready to compete for the Stanley Cup. And the Patrick Brothers League would be recognized by the Stanley Cup trustees who would eventually decide that the Stanley Cup would be awarded to the winner of a series between the NHA and PCHA champions each season, thus ending the Cup Challenge era. And so in 1915, the first ever Stanley Cup final series was played between the Ottawa Senators and the Vancouver Millionaires, which surprisingly, Vancouver ended up winning. And here we are over 100 years later, and that's still Vancouver's only Stanley Cup. <laughs> oh man. In the next few years, the PCHA would expand to the US with the Portland Rosebuds in 1914, the Seattle Metropolitans in 1915, and for one year, the Spokane Canaries in 1916. In 1916, Portland would become the first U.S. team to play for the Stanley Cup, but would end up losing to New Zealand and the Montreal Canadiens. However, just one year later, Seattle would become the first U.S. team to win the Stanley Cup, beating the Canadiens as Bernie Morris set all kinds of records. 
Meanwhile, though, back east in the NHA, things were starting to get heated between ownerships again, as the owners of the Senators, Wanderers, and Canadians had started to get really sick and tired of the Toronto Blue Shirts owner, Eddie Livingston. In fact, they got so fed up with him that they decided to suspend operations of the NHA and form a new temporary league without him called the NHL, adding a new team in Toronto called the Arenas. And although they had intended the NHL to just last for one year, they decided that they liked life without Livingstone so much that they decided to make the change permanent. And once again, what's a new league without some new rules, so they decided to start adopting some of the PCHA rules, but we'll get to that later. And so just like that, the NHL was born. And in its first year as a league and the Toronto Arena's first year as a team, they ended up going on to win the Stanley Cup. And then in 1919, the Canadiens looked to make it back-to-back -back wins for the NHL and avenge their loss to the Seattle Metropolitans as they rematched for the Stanley Cup. Unfortunately, however, as soldiers and even some of them being players started to return from the end of World War I, they brought with them the Spanish flu, which would hit the league right as the Stanley Cup was happening. And so, with players on both teams starting to fall ill due to this global pandemic, the Canadians were eventually forced to forfeit. However, unwilling to accept a victory under these circumstances, Seattle agreed to have the series marked as unfinished. And so, it still is to this day the only Stanley Cup final series that was started but never finished. And sadly, just a few days after the series was cancelled, pneumonia brought on by the flu would end up claiming the life of Joe Hall. Eventually in 1924, even despite its early success, the PCHA would end up folding and merging some of its teams into the Western Canada Hockey League, which would rename to the Western Hockey League and continue to compete for the Stanley Cup. As just a year later, the Victoria Cougars, now of the WHL, would end up winning the Stanley Cup and becoming the last non-NHL team to win it. Finally, in 1926, the WHL would end up folding, just as new teams were entering the NHL, with the Chicago Blackhawks buying most of the players from the Portland Rosebuds, and Detroit buying the players from the Victoria Cougars, and as a result, naming themselves the Cougars in tribute. So with the PCHA and then WHL both gone, the NHL was left the last league standing, and so it was decided by the Stanley Cup trustees that from then on, the Stanley Cup would be awarded to the winner of the NHL each season thus beginning the era of the NHL. In the end, the PCHA would last just over a decade, but its effect on the game of hockey was massive and still very evident today, as the NHL would end up adopting many of the rules first used in the PCHA, such as forward passing, the blue line, the goal crease, penalty shots, and removing the rule that made it so that goalies had to remain standing, as well as introducing the first postseason playoff format. As always, if you have made it to this point, thank you very much for watching. If you did like this video, do hit that like button down below. If you really liked it and maybe even enjoyed it, that subscribe button is still down there. Otherwise, I'd love to hear your thoughts or maybe any questions you have about this era down in the comment section below. I hope to see you next time for the start of the NHL. And don't forget to stay safe out there and just be good to each other. Peace.